Good morning, good morning, good morning. It is Dr. Chris Roddenberry coming to you live from Willow Springs on Thursday, September the 9th. My birthday, woohoo! All right, happy birthday to me, happy birthday to me, and on and on and on. Uh, we were talking in class last night. I guess we have a ton of September birthdays just like me here in class, and I would like to say happy birthday and salute to all you other Virgos. Hope y'all are doing well today. It's good to see you. It is Thursday, so we are getting towards the end of the week. I hope everybody's doing well. Uh, I know I've been talking to some people in class this week. I think we've had A and P and biology exams this week. Um, and you folks have an exam in my class coming up next weekend. So we should be right into the middle of the semester. Everybody, hopefully you were... Uh, you got it going on now, and you've got your rhythm now. Look at that. I got Ashley Lang in 14th, John Ramo at 17th. Look at all these stinking Virgos here. Wow. A lot of September birthdays. Well, don't forget, Ashley and John, to say something close to your birthday so we can give you a birthday shout out as well. So, how many of you came to the... Uh, to the webinar last night. I think we had 47 people. It was a huge audience in the webinar. And we talked about the nature of reality. What is reality? And are we all living in a shared uh, hallucination? Uh, that guy uh, on the TED Talk gave made some amazing points and talked about some really weird concepts. Uh, that I found quite interesting, and I hope you found them interesting, too. Uh, it's good to see Ryan and Amber. Yes, they were there last night. They were adding their two cents worth to the uh, conversation. It was a great time, wasn't it, Chris? I, I think it was uh, it was pretty weird uh, what we were talking about, and uh, Chris participated, too. Thanks for coming last night. Wow, great class, great class. It's good to see everybody here this morning. Uh, who's got plans for the weekend? Anybody got plans for the weekend? I'm going to Chapel Hill to watch my mighty, mighty Tar Heel football team hopefully squeak a win out against uh, uh, an, an, uh, an overmatched team. Uh, we didn't do so well last weekend. I don't know if any of you uh, are sports fans, but my Tar Heels took it right on the chin. Uh, you uh, state fans are probably laughing and enjoying it. Wow, Ashley Lang's daughter's got a softball tournament. Okay, you're in travel softball, huh, Ashley? Uh, Ryan and I both know something about travel sports, don't you, uh, Ryan? I expect you saw as many baseball games as I did in the last 10 years. Chris Anderson's got work going on. Thank you very much, April. I appreciate that. Amber Casey's going to the chat, the Tar Heel game. Uh, yell at me when you get there. Yell my name out real loud, Amber, and if I'm close, I'll say hello to you. I know, man. It is such a grind playing the youth baseball or the youth basketball or whatever you have to do. <clears throat> All right, let's go ahead and get started today. PowerPoint. All right, so if you remember on Tuesday, we were talking about consciousness, this weird sort of... Uh, experience that we all have that's hard to describe, that involves uh, our senses, that involves our memories, that involves our evaluations, our sense of self. And we said that this weird sort of sense of consciousness can change and we can experience different levels of, quote, conscious awareness. Today, we're going to be talking about one special kind of, of, uh, of, uh, conscious awareness, uh, change in consciousness, we're going to be talking about sleeping and dreaming. And this is the conscious, the change in consciousness that all of us experience every day. So if you've never been meditated, you've never meditated, you've never been in flow, you have been asleep. So that's what we're going to talk to talk about today. We're going to start out uh, talking about the nature of human uh, existence and circadian rhythms to begin with. Then we're going to talk about the sleep cycle, 
We're going to talk about what happens in REM sleep, and then we're going to talk about uh, uh, sleep disorders. Oh, I'm sorry, Amber. I thought you meant, oh, wow, your daughter plays softball. Oh, I forgot we talked about that. Your daughter is a stinking college athlete. Ooh, very impressive, Amber. Very impressive. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the circadian rhythm. If you remember uh, last week, we were talking about parts of the brain, and I talked to you about this structure called the hypothalamus. Your hypothalamus is sort of a, uh, if you will, a homeostatic control for your body. It tells you when you're too hot or when you're too cold. It tells you when you're uh, too thirsty or not thirsty enough. It tells you when you're hungry and not hungry. Your uh, your hypothalamus is sort of your master control mechanism. And you know what else it controls? It controls your sleeping and waking cycle. Now, <clears throat> starting at about six, uh, six years, uh, I mean, six uh, weeks after birth, each and every one of us falls into this thing called a circadian rhythm, which is a very organized 24-hour of sleeping and waking that all of us go through every day. It's the 24-hour cycle that uh, controls the biological processes of the human, including sleeping and waking. Now, this, uh, this 24-hour cycle of physiological change, as I suggested, is controlled by your uh, hypothalamus. Your hypothalamus controls the uh, hormones that you secrete at different times of the day. Uh, the hypothalamus uh, controls your body temperature. Did you know that one of the predictors that you're getting ready to fall asleep is that your body temperature drops at night? It's a normal part of your 24-hour cycle. And as well, uh, your waste product uh, uh, production changes based on the time of the day, all controlled by the hypothalamus. But you know what? There's a small set of neurons in your hypothalamus right underneath your uh, optic chiasm, which we're going to talk about in a couple of weeks, called your suprachiasmatic nucleus. Supra means under, chiasmatic means under the optic chiasm, which is your optic nerve, and it's a nucleus of cells, dendrites and cell bodies. So your suprachiasmatic nucleus, or SCN, is located in your hypothalamus. It actually has some nerve fibers that are coming from your eye, and these afferents uh, that are coming from your eye come into your suprachiasmatic nucleus. They are sensitive uh, to light. And basically what happens is your suprachiasmatic nucleus controls how sleepy you feel based upon the time of day. So the suprachiasmatic nucleus is sort of your control center for sleeping and waking. It communicates with your pineal gland and causes melatonin and other hormones to be released at night which makes you sleepy. And did you know what? If you destroy this circadian rhythm, a person's 24-hour cycle of sleep will become all messed up. They'll still spend eight hours a day sleeping, but they won't spend those days, those hours at night sleeping all in one piece. You'll sleep an hour here, an hour there, an hour there. So the destruction of the circadian, of the uh, suprachiasmatic nucleus actually messes up your 24-hour cycle completely. Now, your pineal gland produces melatonin at night, which aids in the sleep process. And you know what? Way down here in your, your, uh, your uh, brain stem, you've got this structure called your pons. It's located right underneath the suprachiasmatic nucleus. It's that bump on the front of your uh, brain stem. If you look at that picture over at the bottom, left-hand corner, and it relaxes your muscles while you sleep. How many of you have ever had a scary, chilly burrito dream where somebody's chasing you, trying to kill you? You know what? The only reason you don't thrash about and kick somebody while you're sleeping is because your pons has caused your body to go flaccid so that you can't move while you're having that scary, crazy dream. Oh, wow. There you go. So Chris Anderson Probably at night, even while you're supposed to be awake, uh, even though you try to get sleep during the day, Chris, I'll bet you you still feel a little bit draggy at night. And that's because your body's chemicals uh, process, your body's hormonal process, controlled by your 
suprachiasmatic nucleus in your hypothalamus still does what it does, even if you sleep during the day. Oh, wow, Ryan's got some sleep disorders. Okay, well, maybe we'll talk about something you know about today, Ryan. By the way, if you want, go ahead and type your, uh, if you want to give us that information, type your sleep disorders in the chat bar, Ryan. That would be interesting to hear. Now, <clears throat> oh, Ryan learned about circadian rhythms in the doctor's office. Yeah, I'll bet you did. I'll bet you probably got as good an education on sleep as I do, Ryan. So if you want to uh, join in and give us any information, I would love to hear your feedback in class today. So let's talk about one way of measuring the brain is to measure the electrical output of the brain. If you remember, I suggested to you that neurons generate action potentials, these brief pulses of electrical activity. You've got 100 billion neurons in your brain. That's a lot of brief pulses of electricity. And these brief pulses of electricity create electrical waves that can be read using an EEG, an electroencephalograph. You know, bizarrely enough, the in electroencephalograph, the EEG uh, uh, machine, was invented by a Nazi scientist in the 1930s who was looking for psychic energy. He believed people had psychic energy. He didn't find psychic energy, but he did find out uh, that brains generate electricity. And in fact, uh, he was one of the first guys to suggest that brains are still active when they are at sleep. And he would be right. Now, uh, what Hans Berger didn't know uh, was that brains generate different types of electrical activity. So the first kinds of electricity, uh, electrical activity that he found was when he asked uh, his subjects just to sit back and relax. And their brains generated these electrical waves. And he called these waves alpha waves, alpha waves. But he didn't realize that your electrical activity changes depending upon what you are doing. So if you think about uh, electrical wave forms, you can look at electrical wave properties of electrical waves in two, uh, in two ways. Electrical properties, uh, electrical waves have two things. They have what we would call a, uh, a, 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 a height of the wave, right? An amplitude, amplitude, which is the height of the wave. And then uh, brain waves activity also have a frequency, which is the distance between waves. Okay, which would be here. This is what we call frequency. And this is what we call amplitude. Okay, and what he didn't realize uh, was that this brain activity changes based upon what we're doing. So uh, further researchers actually went back and measured people's brain activity while they were actually doing stuff. And you know what? They found that people's brain activity uh, was actually much, uh, had their brain activity had much smaller wavelengths uh, and small little jagged wavelengths uh, that weren't very high in their amplitude. And these were uh, called beta waves. And beta waves are what your brain is doing while you're really focused and thinking really hard about something you're doing, okay? So, it turns out that our brain activity changes based upon whether we're relaxed, alpha waves, or whether or not we're really focused, beta waves. But two researchers, Nathaniel Kleitman and William DeMent, uh, used an EEG when people were sleeping, and they found that the brain generated even different types of brain activity, of electrical activity, when we were sleeping. And they were the first ones to identify that brains go into this crazy state called REM sleep when they are, uh, when they are dreaming. And so they identified the fact that human beings cycle back and forth between two types of sleep at night, non-REM sleep 
and REM sleep, which we're going to talk about. Okay. Now, <clears throat> let's say you lay down tonight and you lay on the couch about 1130 at night and you start thinking about going to sleep. Your brain activity is going to change from beta waves, right, which are small and jaggy. You see those at the top of the screen to alpha waves and you're going to begin to relax. And then you know what? You're going to fall into that weird spot in between sleeping and waking. Anybody ever been in that uh, state where you can actually kind of hear the TV and you can hear people talking, but you're kind of half in between sleep and not sleep? You're in what we call uh, stage one sleep. Uh, and your brain starts generating these theta waves. And you'll notice that these theta waves are a little bit taller. They have higher amplitude and they have a longer wavelength. They have a slower frequency than your alpha or your beta waves. And you're in what we might call fake sleep. You're not really sleeping, but you're somewhere between being awake and being asleep. Now, if I let you go on for five or six more minutes, you know what? Your brain's going to start generating these things called sleep spindles and K complexes along with the theta waves. And this represents what we would call true sleep and you are now asleep but you uh, are very you are under very very light sleep and if i touched you on the shoulder you would immediately wake up but you're in what we would call stage two sleep now if i let you go on for another 15 or 20 minutes your brain would then start generating these big sloppy electrical waves called delta waves and when your brain's generating delta waves, you are dead asleep. You are just as asleep as you possibly can. If I was to tap you on the shoulder, you might not wake up. I would have to really, really shake you. And when I show, shake, shook you, you would be awake, but you would be very confused and have trouble waking up. You would be in what we call delta sleep. Now, the crazy thing is when we fall asleep, our brain's electrical activity starts changing, and it goes through this very rhythmic pattern. We go from beta waves, which your, uh, our brain's generating while we're paying attention, to relaxed alpha waves, to theta waves, to we finally fall asleep, and our brain starts generating sleep spindles and K-complexes, and then our brain activity changes to what we would call delta waves, and we are deep, deep, deep asleep. And then you know what happens after that? Our brain activity starts changing again, and those theta waves and sleep spindles come back. And we go back into what we would call stage two, or light sleep again. All right? And if you look at the chart right underneath me, what they're going to do is show you the pattern of how your brain activity changes over a sleep cycle. So let's say you went to sleep. Uh, and you were at zero hour, and let's say you were one of those lucky people that slept eight hours of sleep. This is how your brain activity is going to change. You're going to go from being consciously awake to stage two sleep, which is light sleep. Then you're going to go into deep sleep. You're going to stay there for a while, and then your brain's going to, uh, activity is going to change, and you're going to go into light sleep again, and then your brain is activity is going to change and it's going to look like you are actually awake. Your brain's going to be generating beta and alpha waves. Your brain's actually going to be generating electrical activity as if you were awake. But you know what? You're not going to be awake. Your brain activity is going to change and you're going to go into what we call REM sleep. How many of you have ever heard of rapid eye movement sleep before? Now, Bizarrely enough, it, this is sometimes called paradoxical sleep. Uh, it's actually alpha waves and beta waves. It's alpha waves and beta waves, excuse me. I have a typo there in the chart. It's alpha waves and beta waves. Does anybody know what happens in REM sleep? Can anybody tell me what happens in REM sleep? It's called paradoxical sleep because your brain is actually more awake than it is while you're awake awake and relaxed. Your brain looks like you are super duper active, but you're actually, and I'll bet you Ryan could tell me, you are dreaming. You begin to dream. Now, the crazy thing is, even though your brain looks like it's really, really awake, 
If I shook you, you'd be as hard to awake as if you were in slow wave sleep. And if you did wake up, you'd be very confused and sleepy. Even though your brain looks like it's super duper awake, you're, you would actually act like I had waken you up out of slow wave sleep. Okay. And that's, and it's what's happening is you're dreaming. So, uh, we do most of our dreaming during REM sleep. Okay. And what's going to happen during REM sleep is your body temperature is going to drop, uh, to be similar to the, uh, uh, environment surrounding you. Okay. Your breathing is going to become shallow. Your blood pressure is going to drop. Your body is going to become completely paralyzed and you're going to have dreams. That's what's going to happen during REM sleep. All these crazy things. Oh, and because it's called REM sleep, your eyeballs are going to bounce a little bit. They're going to rapidly bounce around. And this is known as REM sleep. So all these crazy physiological changes are going to happen. Your body temperature is going to match the environment. Your heart rate's going to uh, uh, speed up. Your blood pressure is going to drop. Your breathing's going to get shallow. You're going to become paralyzed. And you're going to dream. And this is what's known as a REM phase. Now, during the course of the night, you're going to cycle back and forth uh, between these different types of sleep stages five to six times. So you'll notice this person right here below me has gone into deep sleep once and then they come up to REM sleep once. And then they go down to deep sleep again and up to REM sleep twice. Then they go down to deep sleep and they come up three times. And then you'll notice they go back down but they don't get all the way to deep sleep. They just go to stage two and that's four times. And then they do that five times. And so this person right here is cycled back and forth between REM and non-REM sleep five times. You do that about five or six times during the night if you are not a narcoleptic. <clears throat> okay? Narcoleptics, when they go to sleep, their brain does not show this kind of pattern of activity. It shows abnormal brain activity. And that's why narcoleptics like D. Dowd, the video I sent you earlier, that's why he falls into sleep in the middle of the day. Because his brain needs REM sleep, and all of a sudden in the middle of the day, his brain will fall immediately into REM sleep, okay? Uh, and he gets REM sleep because your body needs REM sleep, okay? And so, th but this happens with a normal person. Exactly. You can actually see the eyes moving during REM sleep, Ryan. That is a very good point. I'm sure you've been to a sleep study, Ryan, and you've had all of the different uh, uh, electrodes placed over you, and they do that so they can measure these physiological changes that occur during REM sleep. Now, let's talk a little bit about this cycle. If you'll notice, what happens is we get our deepest sleep during the early part of our sleep cycle. So you'll notice that this person spends uh, time in slow wave sleep, but they do most of their slow wave sleeping in the first four hours of their sleep cycle. And that's what happens to you too. And you'll notice that they do the majority of their dreaming, the majority of their REM sleep towards the end of the sleep cycle. And that's the pattern that most of us fall, follow through. So you get your deepest sleep from 12 to 3, and you get your lightest sleep in most of your dreaming done from 4 to 8 in the morning, okay? Now, it turns out that our ability to achieve delta sleep sort of goes away in our 50s, and we don't get nearly as much delta sleep uh, at night starting in our 50s, and this is why your parents and your grandparents are going to complain about their sleep when they get older. In fact, 50% of us are going to have sleep difficulties starting in our 50s. And this is why it's you have to be really quiet when you're at grandma and grandpa's house because it's easy to wake them up at night. Okay? Now, 
not only do we sleep based upon a circuit on the time of the day, but we actually, in a sense, sleep because we need it as well. So we sleep because of uh, uh, rhythms, and we also sleep because of what you might call deficits. Uh, brain uh, chemicals build up in our brain uh, when we haven't been asleep, and these chemicals push us towards going to sleep. It turns out that if you prevent somebody from going to sleep for a while, their brain will begin to get confused and they will begin to demand sleep. And if you keep somebody from sleeping long enough, their brain will fall straight into REM sleep. So researchers have found that if you prevent somebody from sleeping at night for a couple of nights, when you put them uh, to bed that third night, they won't sleep any longer, but they'll spend more time in REM rebound, okay? They will spend more time in REM sleep. It turns out that the only part of sleep we really have to make up is REM sleep. So if I prevent you from getting REM sleep for two nights, uh, when you go to sleep that third night, you'll actually spend more time in REM sleep than you uh, normally would. And that's because your body is trying to catch up on that REM sleep uh, uh, you're missing. So Ryan does say uh, when they do the sleep study, uh, they don't actually make it easy to sleep, right? They've got the, uh, all the cat, the EEG scans on your head, and then they probably got the breathing apparatus on you, and then they're probably measuring your heart rate and your oxygen levels, Ryan. Yeah, they do measure quite a lot of things, don't they? Now, what happens when we go to REM, when we uh, sleep at night, when we go into REM sleep? Our brain doesn't become less active at night when we sleep. It stays just as active, but different parts of our brain become active. All right? So, when we go into REM sleep, uh, our brain activity changes and uh, it changes in a very predictable way. And so I've kind of got this map down here, uh, blue showing you what part of your brain becomes le less active when you're REM sleeping, and which part of your brain becomes more active when you are dreaming. Oh, a lot of the time I cannot go to sleep because my brain continues to think. Uh, it's jumping all over the place. Absolutely. Uh, Sherry, and that's a, a problem that uh, is quite frequent uh, with a lot of people. If you lay asleep, if you lay in the bed at night for more than 20 minutes trying to go to sleep and you do this on uh, a regular basis, you may have a sleep disorder. Ryan, I forget what you said your sleep disorder was. Let's see. Uh, delayed sleep phase syndrome. What's delayed sleep phase syndrome? I'm not familiar with that one. Uh, and your dad has hypersomnia, so he sleeps too much. Okay, uh, so you might be the different than sleep onset insomnia. But if you have trouble sleeping at night uh, and you spend more than 20 minutes tossing and turning on average, uh, you might have what they call sleep onset insomnia. How many of you have, have difficulty going to sleep at night? Go ahead and send me a, a message in the chat bar. Do a virtual raising of your hand and join with Sherry. That's completely uh, normal. And it's your uh, frontal lobe thinking about things at night, Sherry. Uh, you're focused on your problems. Uh, it's Although it's really difficult, uh, if you can learn to relax, maybe turn off the... Uh, the digital media and spend an hour or two quietly. Uh, you might find that it's easier for you to go to sleep at night, Sherry. Jordan has trouble. Dracon has trouble. Yeah, it's, it's quite normal. All right, so uh, when you go into REM sleep at night, uh, <laughs> the frontal part of your brain uh, becomes le less active. Now, the frontal part of your brain is responsible for reasoning, planning, and impulse control. How many of you have dreams where crazy impossible things happen, where you do things that you would never do in, uh, in waking hours, 
where maybe you break laws and rules. Have you ever noticed that your dreams are incredibly crazy and illogical? This is because the frontal lobe of your brain isn't working. And so the part that keeps your reality, if you will, uh, 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 rational is not working as much. And that's why the images that come to your mind are so insane and crazy, right? Now, when you're asleep uh, at night in REM sleep, you're uh, also, what becomes more active, you'll see are these brain areas in red. So you'll see your motor cortex, that strip on your brain, becomes more active. Your amygdala, which is your emotional center, becomes more active. Uh, your pons in your brain stem becomes more active. And your visual association areas become more, re, uh, more active. And this is why you have crazy visions of weird things that don't typically fit together. It's because your visual association is working overtime, putting images together. These images are usually scary because your amygdala, your fear center, is working overtime. In your dream, you're probably running or thrashing or fighting because your motor cortex is more active. And the reason you don't act these dreams out while you're dreaming is because your brain stem is paralyzing the rest of your body. And so this is why these different parts of your brain are more active when you're dreaming. Uh, yeah, and supposedly, yeah, eating late at night can cause you to have bad dreams too, uh, Roni. Yes. Okay. Now, uh, do, 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 do. Ryan Wheeler says he has delayed sleep phase syndrome, which means he's nocturnal. So I'm exhausted during the day and wide awake at night. No matter how much he adjusts his schedule, his body loves to stay awake at night. Well, you know what, Ryan? Maybe you should be one of those human beings that doesn't fight it and just gets yourself a second or third shift job as a career, huh? Right? So, uh, here's the question. Uh, uh, nobody knows exactly why we dream at night, but we, uh, but everybody dreams at night. Now, the reason that nobody remembers their dreams, you ever notice how dreams just sort of disappear super, super quickly? The reason we can't remember our dreams is because our hippocampus is not active while we're dreaming. Remember I suggested to you that our hippocampus is responsible for storing our memory? Remember I talked to you about Clive Waring, the most amnesic person in the world who can't remember anything for more than seven seconds because he doesn't have a hippocampus? Well, when you're having visual images in a dream, your hippocampus isn't active. So these images that you have disappear almost as quickly as they come. Does that make sense? Ah, Look at that. Ryan Wheeler is suggesting that his body generates melatonin at the wrong time of the day. And you know what? That definitely could affect when your body wants to go to sleep, Ryan. That's interesting. That's, so that's the physiological uh, basis of, uh, of, uh, of your delayed sleep onset disorder. Yes, Jan, and you forget your dream. It's impossible. Unless you write your dreams down right as soon as you wake up. Now, if you write them down after you wake up, your hippocampus is working, and then you can remember your dreams. Or if you have, your, if you have a recurrent dream and you have it all the time and you think about it when you wake up because it scares you or bothers you, you will begin to remember that dream. But most of the time, your dreams are images that just disappear. Okay? Now, uh, why do we dream? Uh, of, of when we get to chapter 12 and talk about personality, uh, I'm going to suggest to you that uh, Sigmund Freud, actually, the very famous Sigmund Freud, one of the things that he studied was sleeping in dreams. And he thought people dreamed at night to fulfill the subconscious desires that they couldn't fulfill during the day. So let's say maybe you want to punch your boss or you want to kiss a coworker or you want to rob a bank and you have this desire, this unconscious impulse 
Freud says you can't do that because you'll get in trouble during the day. So what we do is we have these dreams, and he argued that we out, we uh, live these subconscious desires at night in our brain while we dream. Have any of you ever had a dream that kind of embarrasses you because of what you dreamed about, who you wanted to talk to or kiss or what you wanted to do? If you've ever had an embarrassing dream like that, you might be living out one of your subconscious desires. Now, uh, other researchers suggest that, you know what, maybe dreams are just really creative ways of thinking. If you think about it, when we're awake at, and during the day, we typically try to think rationally, and we try to think of things that are logical and make sense. But you know what? Sometimes the best way to solve a problem is to think irrationally, to think critically, uh, to think... Uh, 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 to think in novel or new patterns. And there are lots of anecdotal stories of people uh, solving very important problems in their dreams. I don't know if you folks knew this, but supposedly, supposedly Albert Einstein created the theory of relativity from a dream he had. He had a dream of a train coming into a station, and that gave him the idea for uh, for the theory of relativity. Uh, Robert Louis Stevenson, a famous writer, wrote, uh, wrote uh, uh, um, Mr. Hyde, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. He dreamed that story up and wrote that. Uh, the famous Keith Richards supposedly dreamed the famous rock and roll song, Jumpin' Jack Flash, in a dream. So there are lots of people who think that we solve problems using our dreams. But really what I think a dream is, I think it's your brain's way of making sense of neurological garbage, if you will. So the activation synthesis of theory says that dreams are just random electrical activity that's occurring in your brain while you're dreaming. And your brain is trying to put those sensations together to form a reality. Remember on Tuesday in, for, in that video, uh, uh, Anil Seth suggested that your brain is a prediction machine, trying to put images together in a way that makes sense. Well, when you're having a dream at night, different parts of your brain are active in a non-logical way. And so... He argues, the activation synthesis theory of dreaming people argue that your brain tries to make sense out of these random electrical uh, stimulations and that these sometimes these things don't necessarily go together, but your brain puts them together. And that's why we have crazy dreams that are impossible, right? So who knows why we dream? Uh, the only thing I can tell you is that we all do dream every night. Now, you may not remember your dream. How many of you don't remember having dreams? If you don't remember your dreams, it's because you wake up during non-REM sleep. And as I told you, we don't remember our dreams for very long. So if you tend to wake up in non-REM sleep, you're not going to remember having dreams. And that's why some people think that they don't have dreams. Okay, so John had a dream that he was on a roller coaster, and when the drop occurs, for some reason, your body moves. Now, that's a good point. Some people actually do thrash about a little bit when they have dreams. There's actually a disorder called REM behavioral disorder, John, RBD. And for some reason, these people's pons doesn't make their body flaccid or limp while they dream. And these people thrash about in bed while they're having dreams. And sometimes these people hurt themselves or others. And they actually have to take medicine to prevent them from thrashing about while they dream. But there's a little bit of thrashing that occurs in dreams. Do any of you ever have the sensation of being paralyzed when you wake up? Anybody ever have sleep pull it, uh, Oh, or the hyponic jerk. Ooh, good point. The hypnic jerk, hyponic jerk when you wake up. Uh, right. 
uh, sometimes your body will flinch. You will have a spasm while you're dreaming. And your body will experience that. Some people say they experience waking up and falling into their bed from a foot up. And you having the uh, experience of falling in like that, that's basically this hypnotic jerk that we have while we're sleeping. That's a Thank you, Ryan, for bringing that point up. Your body thinks it's dying. Absolutely. And two days later, oh, ooh, 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 good point. Uh, uh, Ronique brings up a point. Have you ever had a dream about something and it happens? You know, there's a really bizarre theory uh, in psychology. A fellow named uh, Carl Gustav Jung. I don't know if any of you have ever taken the MBTI or ever heard of Carl Gustav Jung. But he argued uh, that people shall share a collective consciousness. Uh, the world shares a sort of consciousness. And he argues sometimes we communicate to each other in a sense, so the world communicates to us through our dreams. So he called what you're talking about synchronicity. I don't know if anybody's ever heard that term, but he argues that occasionally the natural world comes and gives us a hint about something that's getting ready to happen. Just like birds and animals sometimes know when a storm is coming before it gets there, he argues that human beings have that ability as well, although civilization has hidden that ability. But Ronik, he argues occasionally uh, the world will talk to us that way. Now, I don't know if this is scientific psychology, but Carl Gustav Jung is a very famous psychologist from the early 20th century. Uh, and, and when you're dreaming, the alarm is going off and it's actually going off. And that's the crazy thing, Sherry. Uh, sometimes sensory experiences will break through into our brain and will begin creating electrical patterns of activity in our brain. And you just incorporate those sensory experiences right into your dream, don't you? Don't you? Uh, uh, you're right. And so you may hear people talking. You may hear... Uh, 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 fireworks, you may hear your alarm going off, and you take all of these images and just put them right into the dream that you are having. Okay, now how does sleep change over the lifespan? Did you know that infants sleep uh, almost 16 to 20 hours a day, and they spend half of their time in REM sleep? Infants over the first year or so of their life will spend almost 50% of their sleep time in REM sleep. Now, we're not sure why humans evolved the need for REM sleep, but we think it's associated with learning. And who is learning the most in the world? Infants, they're learning how to walk, how to talk, how to think, how to see, how to move their arms and legs. And we think that REM sleep is very important for neural development and learning. And so infants spend the most time in REM sleep. They spend 50% of their time in REM sleep. Now, by the time you get to two or three years old, your brain has already dropped down to its normal amount of REM sleep, which is about 25% of your sleep cycle every night is going to be spent in REM sleep. And that's going to stay the same uh, throughout your life. We all go into REM sleep every night. Now, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, uh, your early adolescence, we all drop down to what we might call our adult sleep pattern. We're getting, you know, and you've always heard that you need to let your kids in early childhood, seven, eight, nine, ten, you need to make sure they get at least 10 hours of sleep at night because your kids in early childhood are going to need more sleep. But starting in the teenage years, uh, you're going to get down to about your normal adult sleep pattern, which is six to eight hours of sleep a night. And that's going to stay pretty much similar through most of your life. Although as you move into your 50s, your need for sleep is going to drop a little bit. And you'll see the chart underneath me, uh, the, the pink and yellow represent your time sleeping. And you'll notice it drops a little bit as you get into middle and late adulthood. 
then your sleep's going to change that way. Now, the crazy thing is your deep sleep is going to begin to disappear as you move into your 50s. Your brain's not going to generate nearly as much delta wave activity uh, uh, when you sleep at night. And that's why older people do have more sleep disturbances. Okay. Now, uh, Ron Rico is still talking a little bit about dreaming about events that happen in the future. And yes, it is definitely a very spiritual thing. And uh, Carl Jung would have suggested, Carl Jung had a very spiritual kind of psychology. Um, uh, uh, Ron, Ron, uh, Ronnie. Uh, and so your mother would certainly have agreed with what Carl Jung, uh, and, I, and that's spelled J-U-N-G, he's a German, Carl, or he's actually Swiss, Carl Jung. Uh, and so uh, you should maybe read a little bit about Carl Jung, uh, Ronique. You might find that interesting. Okay. Exactly. We all do have individual differences in our need for sleep. Some of you absolutely need eight hours a night. I absolutely need at least six hours a night. Some people, like my wife, seem to get away with sleeping four to five hours every night with no ill effects. Um, and so there are differences, individual differences in, in the need for sleep. Finally, uh, uh, um, uh, this is where we're talking about you, Ryan. Ryan, uh, there are lots of different kinds of sleep disorder. Ways in which sleep is disrupted or sleep is difficult or sleep is problematic. Your book talks about several different types of sleep disorders. And I just want to go over them uh, just a bit. Uh, delayed sleep phase is not listed in our textbook. So even though Ryan knows that we're not going to talk about it for the exam. OK, but did you know that sleep disturbances are almost are a common feature in many, many psychological disorders, depression, anxiety, um, uh, bipolar disorder, uh, sleep problems are going to be characteristic of a lot of psychological disorders. So if you're sleeping well, chances are things going are going OK for you. So insomnia, uh, people have difficulty sleeping enough. Now, uh, um, so some of you have difficult, uh, difficulty sleeping at night. Maybe you have trouble getting to sleep at night. That's called sleep onset insomnia. Some of you uh, wake up too many times every night, uh, and that might be called sleep interruption insomnia. So some people have difficulty getting enough sleep at night. Um, uh, insomnia is associated with depression and people who have trouble sleeping at night. Uh, the root cause a lot of times is that they worry about getting to sleep at night. Uh, now you can go to your therapist and they can teach you some easy strategies, some easy cognitive behavioral therapies to help you, uh, uh, get establish good sleep habits at night. So you can go to the doctor and, uh, and work on that. Now I would highly suggest avoiding taking, uh, sleep, uh, medications if you possibly can. They are highly addictive and become less effective the more you take them. So really it's better to try to learn uh, homeopathic or behavioral uh, strategies to help yourself sleep at night. Now, uh, some people uh, experience what's known as sleep apnea. My dad has sleep apnea. He's super duper sleepy at, during the day and he spends a lot of the day kind of drowsing, and falling in and out of sleep. And he doesn't feel, uh, his mind feels cluttered and he doesn't feel sharp during the day. And it turns out that it's because my dad wakes up hundreds of times a night. Now, sleep apnea is a condition occurred uh, uh, that's caused uh, by usually breathing obstructions that cause you to wake up during the night gasping for air. Now, you have a, a area in your brain stem that's responsible for measuring your oxygen level, the oxygen level in your brain. And when your oxygen level drops too low, 
your brain wakes you up so that you can breathe so that you don't die from a lack of oxygen. Now, in people with obstructive sleep apnea, when they go to sleep at night, their throat closes a little bit and they can't get oxygen into their uh, lungs. And this is why some people make horrible snoring and grunting and uh, noises while they are at sleep. Do any of you sleep with somebody who snores and makes really loud noises at night while they're sleeping? This person may have obstructions in their throat uh, that cause them to make these sounds while they're sleeping at night. And this uh, difficulty in breathing or getting oxygen into your lungs causes you to wake up briefly for just a second. It's such a short time that you may not even realize that you are awake. You take a, a gulp, a gasp of air, and then you go back to sleep. But because you're not in sleep for a long time at night, your brain doesn't go through the sleep stages like it's supposed to, and you feel uh, sleepy during the day. Now, how do people treat sleep apnea? Well, one of the things that doctors will suggest is if you're overweight, uh, sleep, losing weight and decreasing the amount of fat around your throat uh, will open up your air passages and let, allow you to sleep better at night. But some people, uh, but some people wear the machine. My dad wears the CPAP machine, and this person below me is wearing a CPAP sort of a version of a CPAP machine. And basically what that does is that blows air into your lungs at night while you sleep. And it goes through the obstruction so that you don't wake up during the night. And it allows you to get that uh, good night's uh, sleep. Now, uh, people with narcolepsy like d Daw, the video, if you didn't watch the video I sent you about 10 minutes to 10, 9, you should watch it. It's amazing to see this guy. A narcolepsy is what happens when people, if you measure them with a sleep study at night, you'll notice that their brain activity is crazy and doesn't look like a person who's asleep at all. And what happens is during the day, their brain needs REM sleep so bad that in the middle of the day, they'll just all of a sudden fall into REM sleep. Now, a lot of people have narcoleptic attacks when they have strong emotions. So if they're laughing or angry or whatnot, it will cause them to go into a narcoleptic uh, fit. So if you're up with D. Dodd and you tell D. Dodd a joke and he starts laughing, he immediately falls asleep, sometimes for 10 minutes, sometimes for 20 minutes. And he'll lose He'll lose motor control. Remember, when you're dreaming, your body becomes flaccid, and he'll just fall right over where he is. In fact, D. Dodd has to wear a crash helmet sometimes so he doesn't hurt himself when he falls over. And he has narcolepsy. Okay, now, uh, sonambulism, sleepwalking and sleep talking. Here's one thing I want you to know. Sleepwalking and sleep talking doesn't occur when you're dreaming. Your body's paralyzed when you're dreaming. Sleepwalking and sleep talking, it's more common in children, and it occurs during delta sleep. It occurs when you're deep, deep, deep asleep, okay? And then REM behavioral disorder, some people are paralyzed when they're dreaming, and so they thrash about during their dreams, and they have to take medicine to help their body, when to help their brainstem paralyze them while they're dreaming. Okay. I kind of swept through this uh, super duper quickly. Does anybody have any questions about today's sleep lecture? Did you learn anything new today? Did you learn anything you hadn't known before? I'd like to thank you, all of you, for sharing your sleep experiences. Uh, uh, um, Ron, Ronique, sharing with your mom's beliefs about dreams. Uh, Ryan, thanks for sharing your sleep disorders. Uh, Erica, thanks for sharing your sleep experiences uh, uh, as well. Uh, and your mom taught during your sleep one time, sleep teaching. That's an interesting concept, Jordan. That's absolutely hilarious. Maybe I could sleep teach sometime. All right, folks, uh, I don't have anything else to, to tell you. If you are coming to the webinar tonight, be sure that you watch the video on hallucinating your consciousness. Uh, uh, before you come to class tonight. If you did not watch 
the uh, video about nar narcolepsy, I highly suggest you watch it. It's absolutely the most amazing 10 minutes of video you will see. I promise you'll find it interesting. Okay. Hey, you folks have a great day. Thank you for the birthday wishes. Take care, and I will see you either tonight at webinar or next Tuesday for Chapter 4, Developmental Psychology. Take care and have a great day. Thank <laughs> you.